Hi, I'm Eric Ostro, host of Live at the Lord Town. For season four, we continue our focus on art and activism. Why do off-Broadway artists uplift certain causes, and how do those causes make them the artists they are today? And while we gather virtually, we'd like to recognize that we occupy land stolen from indigenous people. Join us in acknowledging this history and consider our role in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Eric Ostro. I'm one of the hosts tonight of Live at the Lortel. Uh, we're very excited. We have an incredible, talented guest. But first, I want to bring on my good friend and my co-host, John Andrew Morrison. Good evening, my friend. Good evening, most wonderful, glorious Eric Ostro. And how, how are you? Are you? I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm in Boston today, and I'm very excited to talk to our most scintillating, talented, glorious guest. I am too, so let's get right to it. Okay, so uh, Grammy Award-winning and Tony-nominated actress Danielle Brooks was most recently starred on Broadway in The Piano Lesson, having previously starred on Broadway in The Color Purple. Later this year, she will star in Warner Brothers' feature film adaptation, of the color purple. Danielle stars on the HBO Max series, Peacemaker, mm -hmm. and starred as the legendary gospel singer, Mahalia Jackson in Mahalia, for which she earned the Actress Award for Television from the Critics' Choice Association. Celebration of Black Cinema and Television. Danielle was seen at the Delacorte Theater as Beatrice in Much Ado About Nothing, and is the co-founder of Black Women on Broadway which honors the legacy of Black women's contributions to the theater. Please welcome the extraordinary Danielle Brooks. Hey! Welcome, hello. welcome. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Thank we you are so happy me. to have you. I'm and very every happy. Time, every time you smile, it just lights up your room. I don't even think you need light in a room because it just <laughs> you just light it up. Incredible. Hey. You, Let's you. start what you just finished. Uh, you finished an extraordinary run of the piano lesson. And I was really interested in, I was reading up a lot about you over the past week. I know a lot now, um, <laughs> more than I probably should. And, um, but I was fascinated. I mean, I know where you were first introduced to August Wilson, but I would love for you to tell our listeners where you first learned about August Wilson. Yes, Eric. Thanks for that lovely introduction, too. It was so beautiful. It's crazy hearing all of those things said tied to my name. You're like, wow. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. It happened with time. But <laughs> yes, my first introduction to the piano lesson was when I was about 16 years old. I went to an arts high school, the Governor's School for Arts and Humanity in Greenville, South Carolina. And I went there and I was the only chocolate girl in my class. And I was taught by all white men. And Ooh. they did a lovely job teaching me because they got me where I am. But it was a very different experience for me. And so much so, I stumbled across August Wilson myself. We had a library of plays and um, all of the kids that came before, like there was a book of... Um, monologues that they had done for their auditions for colleges. And so I looked through that book and there was a girl named Stacy Scott, chocolate girl that was two years ahead of me. And she had done Raina uh, from one of August Wilson's plays. And so I was like, Raina. So I read it and I was like, oh, this sounds like, a, I like this black talk. Like, <laughs> this sounds like my cousin or my auntie. I'm like, okay, I like this. So I came across the piano lesson that was in the library. Thank God, whoever put that book in the library, you changed my life. Appreciate you. They put that book in the library and I read it and I could not let that book go, that play, I keep calling it a book, but the play go. I could not take my hands off of it. I could not stop reading it because for the first time, people sounded like me. They sounded like my uncle, my dad, my my grandmother. I just, the, the, I just I never had that because I was reading Tennessee Williams. I was reading Chekhov. Um, I was reading... Shaw, you know, 
So this was my first introduction to a black playwright, period. And I read it. And at the time, my grandmother had passed away. My godmother had passed away pretty young. And so it was a huge hit for me as a 15-year-old, 16-year-old, like having loss for the first time, understanding mm -hmm. what that feels like, grief, and also wanting to honor my my people, my family. And so, it, the, you know, when you know the, the story, it, it just was so intertwined for me. And so I'm, I found this monologue. Um, you ain't taking this piano out of my house. Look at look at this piano. Look at it. Mama Ola promised this piano with her tears for 17 years. When I read that, oh man, it changed my life. And wow. so, however many years later, to get to actually fully invest and embody this woman and learn mm -hmm. her in totality was such a gift for me. And to also like not have to go through the hoo-ha of auditioning for it, which as actors can be so much work and pressure and everyone's not good at auditioning. Like you can be a dope actress, but that doesn't like, sometimes you can lose a job just from the audition when you actually could kill it. Yeah. So I'm really grateful um, to have gotten to do that and like, to, yeah, just to see my name in my face next to the piano lesson. <laughs> it must be surreal to you. I mean, it, does it take you back to being 15 or 16 years old and saying, I'm going to play this one day? I, yeah, because I auditioned. I, if the part I left out was that I ended up auditioning and using that for the audition to go to Juilliard. Juilliard. And so through all of that, um, getting into Juilliard with that piece, um, it just meant a lot. It's so full circle. And I just don't know, like my life's kind of been a lot of full circle moments, like even mm -hmm. with the color purple, yeah. you yeah. know? Um, but this one, it takes the cake for sure. We just also offer the legacy of who August Wilson is and yeah. how challenging it is for any black actor to even get close to getting to portray any of the characters on Broadway is like mm. a feat in itself. So to get to do that, especially as women, because there's not even that many roles in his canon for women. Uh, it was a big deal. Um, so I'm just grateful, y'all. I'm like, yeah, we did it. We did it. <laughs> I'm sorry, John. I have one, one follow-up about the piano lesson. Um, which I, you brought down the house, number one, with that speech. I mean, it's it's a well-known speech. I know a lot of people do it for auditions, but to me, it was as if I was seeing it for the first time. And I was sitting so close, and you were so in the moment. It was a, a magnificent journey you took us on. I mean, everybody in that cast were, was extraordinary but what was the experience you had playing the iconic role uh, of bernice and what is your personal process creating a character through rehearsal uh, we have a lot Ooh. of i think young students that that listen to us and, and really want to know from seasoned artists what your process is like um bernice has such a deep intense sentiment you know not to mention the history of the piano whatever but i'd be interested in in the process of it the process is my favorite part i love rehearsal i could kind of do it out <laughs> being on stage <laughs> That's the hard part. You know, that is the hard part but the process of collaborating is my favorite I spend a lot of time with the script before we get in the rehearsal, um, reading it over and over, reading the monologues over and over, you know, going through each part of like learning about Pittsburgh, learning about the 1930s, learning about women. I love photos. Like photos are my mm. insight. Like th I think photos tell a hundred thousand stories on, for example, you know, looking at women in the 30s and the way their tights were, you know, and how they could have open toe shoes, but still be wearing tights. 
So just that tells me so much about her reserve and, and how modest she might be. I, I just love, I love images. Um, and so I do the deep dive as all of us actors do, but then for me is all about coming with the people in that room mm -hmm. because there's so many things that you discover as you go along. And I love to be the type of actor that flips things on its head. Like I, I love getting to collaborate with people and finding the moments and the, 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 the just the details really together um so for example like working with ray uh he was my love interest in in the in in my, my scene partner and just the little details that we would find together in between the lines there's so much that's said in between the lines and finding that together um to me that's where i love to live uh, mm -hmm. And I think it's that's what like really brings a character to life, not just how you say the words. And of course, you want to focus on your objective and how you get there and all of those things. But I think what makes a really sharp actor are those little details that you find with your scene partner. Um, and so that I, I, I spend a lot of time and I mean, I would come in an hour and a half early every day um, to first get these lines because <laughs> that was mm. a lot of work. Yeah. And trying super hard to be word perfect. And then also uh, me and John David would get together. Um, if Trey Byers came in early, whoever was ready to work, I was ready to work. Uh, so I would always come in early and try to be the last one to leave. Um, and that just serves me well because it's almost like, it's almost like you leaving the dinner table, but everybody might've forgot about dessert and that's like the best part of the meal. So, <laughs> <laughs> stay a little longer because there might be a little more to discover. And mm. that's sort of how I do my, my process. But then the part that sucks the most to me and maybe, you know, I know you can relate to this, maybe John Andrews, because you've been on stage too. Eric, please forgive me if you've been on stage. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Not to the degree. I mean, I've been on, no. I, okay. I, I'm, a, Broadway, I'm a watcher you know, now. Whatever. Yeah, no, no, but no, you, no. You, know, you know what it is to do this. Of course, yeah. Um, I just hate when we have to lock a show. Like, I really don't like, and if for you all that might not know what lock a show means, that's basically once you've opened, that show is set and you can't right. go changing things to it. And I'm cool with that. Like, I'm cool with the don't move this fork anywhere else but the place we right. sit set. But when it comes to, like, the the back and forth that ball mm -hmm. bouncing with my fellow actor if we find something new let's play yeah. like i like, right. i'm like let's go uh, i don't like staying stuck because there's something like i just feel like there's always something to discover and that's why we do live theater is yeah, to continuously really. discover not to just stay stuck in a rhythm so uh, that's the only thing about my process that starts to get hard is when we like actually transfer and have to stay, you know, the course. <laughs> I think what's amazing for the audience is that when, when we watch good plays and good directed plays and amazing actors is the discovery that we're watching you discover. I mean, that's, that's the key to good theater that it's in the moment in the moment. I mean, you know what though? Like once you're running, you're still going to grow and play, you know, just like do what you do because you got to do what you you got to do what you got to do. Anyway, I mean like you're like, all right, don't step off of this mark because the light ain't going to hit you. But like if something needs to grow, grow it. But the 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 thing that I was very curious about was these two moments in your life hitting this play and what it is what is it like to encounter this as a girl and then to encounter this as a grown woman just the same text and how does that like resonate differently 
in your life as as a as a young woman and now as a grown woman being able to come back to this text and like how how did that sit and hit in your Ooh, in your being that's a good question that's such a good question this is why i love talking to theater folk y'all be asking the right questions everybody else be so general um <laughs> like we can talk you know yes that's um, what we want just talk I, yeah <laughs> It like so yes, I went through, you know, my first traumatic experience of losing some two people that was very close to me. So I had that, but I did not have the like life experience, you know. The the one thing that was strong for me was the sense of family, like the importance of legacy, the importance of inheritance the importance of remembering those that came before you, that has always been like strong. So the foundation of the character of Bernice, I had that part, but it's all that other stuff of what it means to be a wife, what it means to have given birth and now raising a child, which are now experiences I've had and are in living. Um, what it is to even own a home. And you know, like, because because Bernice is <laughs> yeah. somebody who's running this house. She's the the, the head honcho of mm -hmm. this, this home, you know, the woman of the house. And what it is to, like, really not know what it is to have a check coming through, you know? Um, so all of those things have now gotten deeper. Uh, and, and also, like, my relationship to the ancestors have grown. Uh, mm. That's a whole, that's a whole nother conversation. Cause I was having, I was like, that really was real for me uh, connecting to them. Those that are, are on, have crossed over mm -hmm. and having conversations with them at the end of the play. And also like now I've matured as an actor. So I know, I know, when to like when I'm going too far, mm -hmm. when to pull back, you know, because you can lose yourself in some characters too. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and talking to the dead, as some people might think I'm crazy, I don't care, but talking <laughs> to the dead can go deep, you know what yeah. I mean? And at the time, well, like I just lost my brother Darius Barnes, who y'all might know, uh, who's a choreographer yeah, yeah. Um, for Kimberly Akimbo, mm -hmm. and like just having like I also had another friend who passed away who actually was a piano player that I grew up with so just really um hearing their voices now in mm -hmm. a way that my 15 year old self it would have scared me first of all and I just mm -hmm. wouldn't have been able to 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 navigate so it's it's a big transition uh going from the 15, 16 year old to now a grown woman yeah, uh, yeah. playing her. Um, and it's crazy because people used to say that to me, like you need more life experience. And uh, I, I think like you're living life. So that's life experience. Like you're going through it. You know, you might not know what it means, you know, for some aspects of your character all the way yet. But that's okay, I think. But then it's a whole nother thing when you actually have gone through mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of yeah, yeah, your character yeah. is experiencing and the depth, you can just go deeper. Yeah. Um, so that was the exciting part for me was getting to go deeper with her. And um, can I? Yeah, go ahead, John. I, I just want to ask. Um, uh, how 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 do you how do you leave the character at home especially when like you're doing you're doing something and it's all right it's kind of now in your spirit in your experience how do you the actor then go okay show is done i got to i got to put you to bed do you have mm -hmm. uh, something that you do or some kind of ritual or some way of like i got to i got to leave you here for the night August actually helped my Bernice because I, I can only speak for my version. Um, but for me, he helped by writing after calling on them, saying thank you, thank you. 
And yet that was my way of releasing it is acknowledging mm. what just happened, saying mm. thank you to the them, the experience mm. and, and letting it go. And then for me, always taking off their wig. <laughs> yeah and especially you're in a broadway theater full of ghosts full of yeah. ghosts right like i mean these those buildings are just haunted like yeah nobody's business. yeah oh so. yeah <laughs> what's the um so i mean you had a baby. How old is she? Two? She's three now. Three. Um, My almost three and a half. What time yeah. flies. Um, the experience of, of having um, this baby girl, um, what, how did you change as an artist? What, what has she brought to you? First of all, like, I was able to shed a lot of my own insecurities. Mm -hmm. I held a lot of um, anxiety when I yeah. did Color Purple. Really? Uh, okay. Oh yeah. I just, I, I felt like a fraud. I felt, mm. um, I had the imposter syndrome. Mm. So you, felt just, under, you felt non-deserving. Wow. Yes. And I worked hard. Believe me, if you only I'm knew sure. how many Broadway shows I had auditioned for, in the past and just right. no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. So when I finally got it and then I was nominated for the Tony, it mm -hmm. just, it, it rocked my world. I was like, there, I don't understand. I don't understand. They are going to find out. I really can't <laughs> sing. And like my acting skills are not that great, which is all this false narrative I had created. But a lot of it became from feeling alone and feeling like there's all of these eyes on me. And I just had all this pressure. But the minute I was pregnant with my daughter and I stepped into Shakespeare in the Park, yeah. uh, Much Ado About Nothing, gone. I don't know yeah. what it was. And, and the reason I think it, I actually do feel like I know what it was. I think it was knowing that I wasn't alone. Like I had somebody with me, like my daughter was actually with me. And then also <laughs> because when you're pregnant, you have mommy brain and I'm up here doing Shakespeare. <laughs> I was just like, if anything goes wrong, I'm just going to blame it on uh -huh. being um, to be like, like you, you got mommy, mommy, you got pregnant mind. Yeah. I got, you got pregnant. Yeah. Head. <laughs> I got pregnant here. <laughs> so it just it really laxed me up. It just helped me to understand, like, I'm not alone. And so when Freya is, is her name, when Freya yeah. um, came over to the other side and was Earthside, and I was now in piano lesson, I had to also remember I'm still not alone. So mm. now I have mm. them in the flesh, but, like, I'm a very spiritual person. So I had to remember like, oh yeah, God is with me now. Like God is here. I'm not alone. We're going to rock this thing out and we're going to do what we have to mm. do. It's not the end of the world. If this thing crumbles, because there's going to be some gold at the end of the tunnel. I just, mm. it has to be. Mm. So yeah. it really loosened me up having my daughter. It just really also reminded me like, why I'm doing it, the purpose changed, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, it wasn't all about me anymore, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I have completely have and that completely helps shifted. with this imposter syndrome. I read in an article, uh, when you say the only time you felt fully free and at peace was when you were uh pregnant and playing Beatrice in Much Ado About Nothing. Um, I mean, but Beatrice is such a physical and and taxing role i mean you know it was an incredible performance i mean you were all over that stage and, and <laughs> ate it up. I, was, I was rolling under the you the ate that stage up and then you put it, it in so your handbag fun. and off you went i mean it <laughs> that was a phenomenal show um Thank you for seeing it. It was oh. so much fun to play. Like I, we were yeah. supposed to actually, uh, we had a chance to go to Broadway after we yeah. did it. 
but I had, was pregnant and could, oh. I was no way I was, could do it. So we weren't able to, but I would, that's one. You might can get me back to do that one for sure. Cause uh, <laughs> I just, I was, it was like, that's what I'm talking about. Like living in between the lines mm -hmm. and like breaking that. I love breaking up the words and really busting them open and making them mine. Like I, it was so much fun getting to like say senior been a dick you know and like yeah. <laughs> landing the dick because i'm trying to get to him you know get under his skin like i love finding moments like that uh so i i had a blast and my scene partner grantham coleman was so wonderful to work Red with after, yeah over. the whole cast was having fun i mean it was like an explosion on that stage and you know we as audience members can see and tell when everybody is really enjoying themselves. You know, it, it, it's not, you know, you're following the play. It's not, not that it's not Shakespeare anymore, but it's, it, it was set in an incredible time and everybody was so perfectly cast and Thank so you. free. There was no tension or, inhibitions or I, yeah. I didn't see any insecurity on that stage. Everybody knew where they were and where they were going. And it just was, it, when you feel that on stage, we can feel that in the audience. That's mm. beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Shout out to Kenny Leon for directing uh, that, but also like really giving the, us the freedom, you know, like he, he's always come from a place of the best idea will win. And he truly yeah. means that. Mm -hmm. And I just really respect that because he can allow his ego to like be out of the room to make sure that we tell a great story. Right. And so I appreciate him just letting me fly. Like he just let me, I would have an idea. He's like, yeah, go just see where it goes. <laughs> really appreciate yeah. that. The yes. Give you the yes, gives you the permission to at least try. Mm -hmm. And it might fail, but like you get to try it. And that's great. Mm -hmm. I I have to tell you, I saw Color Purple on Broadway four mm -hmm. times and I <laughs> loved you <laughs> in that show. And I loved that show. And so I'm just like curious about, you know, that was your Broadway debut. What was the experience of like doing, because the response I mean, it was electric. There was something oh. electric about that, about that show, and and the simplicity of the staging, but the vibrancy of that story and these uh, and these black bodies on the stage. I like I it killed me every time, wrecked me, wrecked me, wrecked me, and I loved it so so much. So that play, what, that what a way to make a that, debut! That theater shook. It it shook. Yeah. Yeah, it, um, it was did, super special. How did it come to you? Yeah, it was so special. It was magic. It was magic, and I don't like using that word. I'm kind of like it's kind of overused to me, but that one was super special, and I think that's why some of my anxiety came out too, is because we knew what we had. We knew mm. at a certain um. point. Oh my gosh, people are coming to see this four or five times. Mm -hmm. You know, people are like holding hands at the end of this play who've never met each other and are crying to each other. And so we knew the weight of this responsibility that we had as storytellers that it could, it at times could feel overwhelming. Mm. But I think we had such a great ensemble and, and, I just loved how everybody really supported each other through that process that we were able to like create what we created. And, and our director was phenomenal. Like I John love, Doyle. I love, oh, him. Yeah, John Doyle. love his work. Yeah. Oh, he broke, you know, just the simplicity, like you said, and, and breaking it down and getting back to the basics, which again, I love to, make a baby out of a sheet, you know, and then <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And then make it um the waters of Africa or like I just yeah. I loved that production and being a part of it was super special for me. And, and that's I don't know if y'all know this full circle part of that for me, but 
Um, the Color Purple was the first Broadway show I saw at 15. Oh. I had won this like competition in Greenville, uh, and they were flying like 15, 20 kids out with their parents wow. to New yeah. York. And I had won, and me and my daddy went out, and Color Purple and Lion King was the only two shows that had black people in <laughs> And my dad Color Purple changed my life, changed my life. I was like, what? Like, I can do this yeah. as a profession? Yeah. Like, I don't just wow. have to, like, stay in Greenville? Like, I can actually yeah. go out and do it. And so, yeah, 10 years later, I was in Color Purple, The Revival, uh, which is so crazy to me because it's just that reminder of, like, letting life do what it does. Because, again, I had auditioned for so many shows and I kept hearing no and I just couldn't understand why. And now, you know, you under, I understand the why. Mm. And I would not trade it for anything. It's, a, it's just changed my life completely to even now I'm getting to do a movie. And yeah. you understand now that you being on that stage, there's some Black girl who's seeing you and going... 100%. Yeah. That's why yeah. you, you can't have an off day. You know, the responsibility right. to someone else's life right. and, and what they're supposed to discover about who they are rides on you sometimes. Yeah. And I know that. And I know it firsthand because knowing LaShance now, but mm -hmm. and getting to tell her in her face, like, you've changed yeah. my life. You know, yeah. losing Tony to Renee Goldsberry when she was uh, playing Nettie. In this mm -hmm. original, play. you oh, know, dear right. like, yeah. yeah. So when she took that home, I was like, "Go ahead, sister, because you changed <laughs> my life." In that, you know, <laughs> uh, so I definitely understand that this this what we do is so intertwined with other people's lives. So I never, I always have to give everything I got. Always, mm. it's never. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I saw it, I had to see it three times because I had to see um, Miss oh, Hudson, yeah. I had to see Heather. Miss he Heather. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, didn't, I did not want to, <laughs> there was one of those shows that you are sitting next to a stranger and you're, you're holding hands and you are um, at the end there. And then I went back and I saw uh, Jennifer Holiday, but um, the excitement on that stage and the the shininess and the excitement and the audience, um, even though there was a lot of talking back, it it worked. It just seemed to work. And I, I had, we had the opportunity to interview John Doyle. Um, probably a couple of years after um, the show. And he said that that was one of the favorite jobs he ever did in his life mm. because it just was, it just came together. Like uh, the, the pieces just came together so beautifully. And yeah. um, it, how did, what changed when you went in for your audition for the color purple I know that you had been out of Juilliard for a little while and you were getting a lot of rejections. <laughs> what changed when you walked into yeah. that room? So, <laughs> taking it back. Um, okay, good. So I had auditioned <laughs> for a lot of off-Broadway, Broadway, kept getting a lot of callbacks. After call I'll never forget auditioning for Rent off-Broadway. And Billy Porter was an um, associate directing and we were in the auditions and they're teaching us the dance stuff. And I'm not the best dancer. I can dance, but I can't remember choreography like that. So I knew what my weakness was, but I played, I always played against it. So they got us doing all this doop, 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 doop stuff. And I remember after we did the, the number, I popped in a split because I was like, y'all gonna see me. 
Y'all going to take me to the next level. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget Billy Point going, now that's how you get a call back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Little baby Danielle, I didn't get the job, but it was just a lot of getting so close, but not getting it, getting so close. So crazy enough, a lot of people don't know this, but it's at, it's that time where you know you can share stuff because it's been some time. I had auditioned for Diane Paulus um, for um, Pippin, and they were looking for someone to replace Patina Miller. Mm, and I was as really the leading excited. player, yeah. As the leading player, because Patina and I, she's from South Carolina, too. We went mm. to the same high school. Um, oh. She's a little older than I, but um, she's just always been like a role model to me growing mm. up. And so I was like, oh, my gosh. I got and, and mind you, this is after Orange. So my star is starting to rise. Right. And so I was like, this is cool. Like, they, they're, they must be reimagining this character a little bit and seeing what, you know, other people can bring to it. I had gotten like six, seven callbacks for this. I was getting real close. And the final one, they said, Danny, um, they want to just do a, um, what you call it? A workshop? Not even workshop. A director's a work session. Yeah. Session, a director session with you. Mm -hmm. So in my head, I'm thinking director session is going to be me and Miss Paulus. We're mm -hmm. going to get in there, piano player. We're going to just work some stuff out. No. It was like 20 <laughs> people in a room in suits. Mm. This was it. And I was not ready. So oh. I go in there, can't find the note to the song flat, working on trying to do the sides, can't remember the lines, tr just trying, like joke after joke, trying to like waste mm -hmm. time to get myself together, mm -hmm. falling apart, falling apart. At this point, one of the casting directors on his phone, not paying attention. And I finally just said, I'm sorry. I'm cutting this audition short. <laughs> I cut my own self off. I said, this is not what I want you all to remember me by. And I know that I'm better than this. So I'm going to have to politely walk away. And I, they were so sweet about it. I mean, I was a hot mess. I was a wreck. I was very sad because, you know, like this is such a of huge course. opportunity. And I just didn't make the mark and couldn't pull through. And they were lovely. Like Diane ended up writing me a lovely letter. Telsey ended up reaching out because um, they believed in me, but it just mm -hmm. wasn't working. Right. And so immediately after that, I went straight into private dance lessons. I was paying a girl $50 to help me get a rate <laughs> to, you know, sachet pot of a rate. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And I went into singing lessons and I was just like, I need to prepare. Just because yeah. I finished Juilliard does not mean that mm -hmm. I have everything set. You got to keep going, to right. To keep working on your skills. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what I did. And from there on, the next audition I got was Color Purple. And mm. I was ready. My <laughs> mind was ready. Yeah. I could move whatever you needed me to do. You know, my mental was like ready for this. And so, yeah, I went in. It was between me and two other women that are I have much respect for in this industry. And I ended up taking it home. Thank yes, you, Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Fabulous. I Fabulous. love that you, when you were in the Pippin audition and you stopped yourself and you said, I'm better than this. I, I can't, I'm not giving it to you today because I don't, I'm not ready. Mm -hmm. That yeah. takes guts. Yeah. Because yeah. I think a lot of people just would have gone through the motions but yeah. what you did was you knew that it just wasn't working. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's it's that weird thing of like you cannot get to this point where you're like, oh, if it's for me, it is for me. And there's also something about the readiness, the being ready to show up for the opportunity that I love in that in that story. And and sometimes you have to lose the one 
to be able to kind of show you what mm. you need to do for the other thing. It really, so like, it really is a continuum. You know? I, I mean, it, God couldn't have written the story any better. The yeah, fact yeah. that I learned all of those lessons from that one experience, but also gained so much from actually getting to step into this for my first time. Because mm -hmm. if I would have got Pippin, it closed, I'll never forget it closed like first week of January. And so I would have been in it for two months. I would have thought, mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I'm the reason it closed. You know, there right. just would have been no, you know, <laughs> there would have been no no gain in it. Mm -hmm. But with this, it was I get to talk about it, you know, Color Purple being my first show I saw and now getting to be in it, getting to have mm -hmm. the connection with Miss Oprah, now getting to do the movie. That would have not happened if I would right. have taken that course, path that I thought I could yeah. have taken. Yeah. Well, let's let you mention it. So let's talk about the movie. So <laughs> we all can't wait. And I know there's probably not a lot you could tell us, but um, I mean, I know who the I know who's cast in every part, but uh, are you finished filming? Oh, yes, we are filming, okay. finished filming. I can tell you that much. I can tell you that this one's definitely one for the books. Ooh. It is gonna be so good. Oh. I'm, and I mean that, you know, because I would, I would be talking about it a lot differently if I didn't feel that way. But what our director Blitz has brought to this, and the cast, Coleman Domingo, we have so many theater mm. in this. Corey Hawkins, myself, Fantasia. Um, I'm sure I'm missing somebody who's done theater too. Even Taraji P. Henson is a theater yeah. girl. She hasn't done mm -hmm. Broadway, but she's done theater. Um, yeah. So it's just something special. I can't it's wait to see Taraji. Like, yeah. And they put the money behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and the storytelling is just, it's just so good. And I cannot <laughs> wait to, um, I can't wait to, the holidays. I know it's coming out around the holidays. I don't really know which one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what they're doing, but I know that it's coming this year, and uh, I'm excited for everyone to see it. What's your Oprah experience like? Is I know you don't like to say the word magical, but you know, what's yeah. what's just the energy like i mean i can only you know in my head we are the best of friends and you know i'm at her montesino house and we're sitting outside in those okay. chairs drinking yeah. some of her favorite tea and we you know talk for hours a day yeah. um maybe you know, ellen comes crazy. over from next door i just you know that's that's my daydreaming but um what is your experience with this goddess? I'm still daydreaming with you. I'm still <laughs> walking on a hike. I'm <laughs> on a hike in Hawaii. Um, no, it's been really great. You know, I the first time when I stepped in the cover purple on Broadway, I wasn't able to truly form a bond with her. And, you know, I think some of it has to do with me because I don't ever want to feel pressed or like I want something from someone. So I kind of kept my distance a lot. And, you know, if God brings us together, cool. And then during that time, we weren't really close at all. So when she called to give me the job personally, it meant a lot because the one thing I felt like I never got to say to her was thank you. I never mm. really got to say thank you for choosing me to do your this part that you originated. And I was able to tell her that. And then I was able to ask her, you know, questions. We got on the phone and I was asking her questions. She was telling me all these amazing stories about her experience in doing the movie 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then like, you know, we start talking more and she's dropping me voice memos. And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> From Oprah, you know, like it's great. <laughs> you know, it's it's, it's super cool. You and then for her those. to show up, she's 
She, oh, I will. I'm, I'm not oh, getting yeah. rid of my phone for that. <laughs> like, I literally have a new number, and I'm just keeping it. Just for that. <laughs> number. I'm keeping my old number. There. But uh, just uh, now, you know, I'm I'm able to really form a true f- relationship and friendship with her. And we have this bond that a lot of people don't get to have. You know, mm-hmm. I think of, um, what's her girl's name? Ariana DeBose a lot. Mm-hmm. And I think about her relationship to the woman who played, um, Lord. With Rita Moreno. Yeah. yeah, Rita Moreno. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And how rare that is that yeah. you get to connect with the person who originated something that special. So I'm, I feel like the luckiest girl in the world, you know, and I'm grateful to have come to this path without forcing anything, uh-huh. without ego, without being a diva, just naturally letting life happen the way it's supposed to be. And uh, things have come to me, you know, and this one is very special to have her friendship and for her to come to piano lesson and see me in that oh, meant a lot been, so of yeah. course I'm, yes. I'm i'm wondering now um because you work in all the mediums that actors work in right so you you work in film you work in tv you work in theater um for the people who might be watching uh what's the difference how do you adjust the the single craft that is acting to meet all of these d- different mediums? Like what do you, how, how do you change your mindset or y- your scaling of your technique to be able to meet um, the different medium that you're working in? Yes, I've had to learn that with time because that's something I feel like Julia actually doesn't teach you uh, mm-hmm. that much of, at least when I was a student, we weren't getting film courses. We weren't getting mm-hmm. how to act for TV. We were getting theater straight, Listening, responding, you know, what you want, how you going to get it. <laughs> that was the way it worked. So I had to learn that along the way. And I remember my, uh, like my second episode of Orange is the New Black. And the director wanted me to like get on the table and just be big and bold and just do whatever I wanted to on this table. And I said, Sir, are you sure you want me to do that? Because I thought I was supposed to be small on TV. He was like, no, go for it. Go for it. What? I was so confused. And that's when I realized most of that, the calibration is so minimal. It's so like 20% of the job of, or of, of, of adjusting to these different mediums. The 80% is all about being honest and true to your character. If your character is big and bold, that's what it is, you yeah. know, whether that's TV, film, or theater. And that's the same across the board. It's like you can have somebody, I always think of um, uh, Leslie Odom Jr. when he was in Hamilton and just how small his choices was. Yeah. You know, he didn't have to do, yes, he had his big numbers, but with his, his choice and character was very small movement. Yeah. So it, it that part is this always just that's the 80% to me. But then the 20% is like, okay, the camera's closer. So you doing mm, so much mm. with your face is not gonna be the thing to do unless that's <laughs> what you're doing. right. You know, uh and then I realized that in theater too, like I would go all the way to the top, top seat right before some of the shows. And I was like, they can't see my face for nothing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I realized there got there has to be moments that I scale it up mm-hmm. so that they can really feel what I'm I'm doing, even if you can't physically see my facial expressions. So it's all been, you know, a lot of learning throughout the years. But my biggest thing is as long as you're honest and true. That's all you really need. Everything yeah. else can be taught. You know how to step on a a, a, a mark. How to get your and, mark and all that stuff. Yeah, that right, stuff you know. can be taught, but the the eighty percent is the most important, and that's just staying true to who your character is. Yeah. Well, speaking of tasty, 
what is um, that overnight experience? I mean, you, I mean, Tasty was your, your first, you know, well, <laughs> there she goes. She <laughs> now, but you go from kind of obscurity to walking down the street and everybody knows, screaming at you probably, Tasty, Tasty. I mean, it was scary. Yeah. It was what's, scary. That, what's that like? Uh, thir- in the course of 13 hours, my life had changed. I yeah. was, 13 hours famous. Wow. That's all. It's 13 episodes, 13 hours. I remember it like yesterday of just the numbers on Instagram growing and yeah. taking the subway and like groups of eight, you know, teenage girls hollering, that's tasty. And <laughs> I still got five more stops to go, you know, getting on the bus. Or even being in a car and somebody like coming up to the car at a stop light and kissing my cheek because my window was down. Like, I remember these moments. I remember, especially Pride, when we would go to Pride events during that time, <laughs> it was like we was the Jackson Five. Like, we was New Direction. Is that the group's name? New Direction? Yeah. We was whatever big group, we was there. Like, we had to have security. It was insane. <laughs> so to the point, like my therapy sessions became about that. Like, how do I navigate? Which was yeah. actually really great because the show had so many women of different levels in their career. Mm-hmm. So you had like the newbies, myself at the time, Samira, Uzo, Aduba, Adrian Moore. Right. We're all the new right. ones. But then you have like Natasha Leon, Laura Prepine. Right. Um, Kate McGrew, yeah. they've done this for a while. T- Taryn Manning, they they so they were able to school us on what a manager was, <laughs> what a business uh. manager, you know. And then it was tough because Netflix was so new, right? So we've well, thrown into fame, but yeah. ain't got no money. So <laughs> now, all of a sudden, we're supposed to look like something at this event and roll up in a car. But we ain't got no car money. We ain't got no new clothes money either. So you're pull, you you you're jumping on the subway and and pulling oh something from your closet. I remember. I remember Natasha Leon took me and Samira Wiley to a concert. It was a Eminem concert. Everybody was there, like Busta Rhymes, all these big rappers, <laughs> and they gave me and Samira a badge that said celebrity. And we were like, oh my God. <laughs> what, is going on? what is happening? And I kid you not, this celebrity took the picture at the step and repeat with black leggings on and a hole in her <laughs> leggings. <laughs> like, <laughs> trying to be cool, like. Yeah. But you had a big ass hole in your in your. <laughs> <in your pants. laughs> Oh yes, started from the bottom. Now we're here for real. Oh it my was, gosh! Yeah, so Are, you know, go ahead. I I just want to ask because the time is coming up, and oh. one of my favorite things is a home and garden TV show, and your renovation show on Netflix blew my mind. So oh. we need to talk about that, and then also Peacemaker. Um, John Cena kind of fine. <laughs> and I really enjoyed that superhero series. So can you talk about both of those things? Oh, sorry. <laughs> we also, before we leave, we got to talk about Black women on Broadway. So oh, right. Let, sorry. Let's, let's, uh, okay, uh, uh, give us a couple of things on Cena. And, uh, yes, John Cena, yes. He, uh, the hardest part for me was like, dang, his muscles are so yeah. big. Like his <laughs> fingers are big. Do you feel yeah. me? Like his uh-huh. knuckles, that's how much muscle he has. <laughs> it's crazy. That's yeah, my dream but... too with Oprah. He's sitting next to me. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was great. I love Peacemaker because um I was able yeah, to really 
Oh, thanks. So just open the box up a lot for women that look like me and we can be in DC and Marvel too, yeah, you know? Yeah, we can absolutely. Be running around just alongside a John Cena. That's so absolutely. that was really right. special to me. So I'm really grateful to James Gunn for bringing me along for that ride. And we're still going. When we going, I don't know, but we're going. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, and then with the renovation show on Netflix, Oof. that was really special, uh, getting to just change people's lives that are really uh, deserving of In that. one day. In one yeah. day. I know. It's crazy. It is crazy. Like, the team is a team of like over 200 people. It, it was it was a lot of fun to host. And, and also, just like, not have a script to just kind of yeah. Do my own thing. You were just kind of improvising, life. right? Mm -hmm. And let people see who I am versus just the people that I get to play on TV. So that I was think that's fun. nice when we get to see, you know, who you really are on something like that. I mean, and, you know, you weren't this little dainty little host, you know, <laughs> that, that's got a script. You were you. Were you you yeah. were you like you yeah. are right now. But mm -hmm. I, we need to talk about... Um, Black Women on Broadway, uh, which is something you started. Tell us a little bit about it. Yes. And, um, and how we can contribute. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah, so Black Women on Broadway is very near and dear to my heart. It was started by myself, Amber Iman, and Justin Bio, two other fabulous Black women that are in this industry as well. And we just really wanted to create a space for Black women to understand that they are seen and they are valued in this space. It is not only for Broadway women, but off-Broadway, regional, mm -hmm. and young girls that are in college and are looking for a place to be in this business. We want them to know through leadership courses that we are giving out, mentorship, mm -hmm. and um, just, uh, yeah, really leadership courses that we've done. Um, to know that they can be producers, they can be stage managers, there's other positions that they can do that might not be, you know, the actor uh, that are just as valuable. So we really have been focusing our energy in that, as well as our soiree that we do. We've just had our first one last year that takes place a week before the Tonys, where we gather as many Black women together and celebrate three. We honor three women. Um, and we, you know, just want everyone to know that they are seen. There's a place for us. We love the Tonys. Hope to get one one day. Um, but we also want to know that, like, let, let Black women know that we see you and we can acknowledge each other's uh, accomplishments um, just as much uh, as we would like that from other people. We, we can do that first for each other. So that's and if what you want to uh, check more out about it, it is uh, www.broadwayblack.com. No. no, no, okay, no, Correct it's me www then, blackwomenonbroadway.com. Blackwomenonbroadway.com. <laughs> I beg yes. your pardon. Even though we do love Black Broadway, this one is BlackWomenOnBroadway.com. BlackWomenOnBroadway.com. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> what is, um, besides all of that, what, what can people do to, you know, be involved with your organization? Yes. Um, you can hit us up on the website. There's a, a page on there to contact us if you'd like to be involved. We do do our celebration every year, which we're hosting this year in June. So we're looking for volunteers. We're looking for people that are willing to give finances as well. It's tax deductible. We don't make a dime off of this. And it's only three of us grassrooting this thing. So mm -hmm. please, please help us out. If you can, a dollar, $25, 25 cents. It don't matter, but we really want about a hundred thousand if you help us out. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> but also like if there's any, um, thing that you need from us, when we'd had the pandemic, a lot of girls were like, just not understanding what to do with the time, like wanting to get into producing, but not knowing how. And so if there's a skill that you have that is valuable 
to yeah. someone else's growth, please share that with us in an email. We would love to share that uh, and get something started. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I'd like to end a little bit about what you said. And I have a quote here and, and what you want to pass on. Um, I think about how I want your daughter, you know, how I want her to live, speaking of your daughter. And I have to be that example for her. So I'm sitting here beating myself up every day and, and she sees that. And that's not the example I want her to see. I know um, I give her daily affirmations every day. How is that something you do every day? You give her a daily affirmation. We get up at 7 a.m. I get her ready for school. And the first thing I say when she looks in the mirror, Freya, you're beautiful. Look at your hair, Freya. Look at your cheeks, your skin. Every morning, every morning, she gets affirmations from her mama. Wow. That is I love it. That. That's what Could I you want call me in the morning and give me a few. <laughs> I could use just a, just a couple more. It doesn't have to be all, but maybe once a week. I got you. I got you. I got you. Oh my uh, God. Danielle Brooks, You're this, awesome. has, this has been an in, incredible honor. Um, John Andrew and I are both huge fans. We think you're extraordinarily uh, talented. And um, what you Thank give you. back to us and the world uh, we're very grateful for. And um, so we thank you. Thank you. And we I thank, thank you, you all for having me, for, you know, taking the call and, and doing this podcast is very important to our community. It's super we important so. for those that are coming up. You know, I just really thank you all for doing and creating a space for us to talk about what we do in the craft and how much we love it. Because I know growing up, I was obsessed with watching like as much as I could about yeah. certain artists that I love. So I really just appreciate you allowing the space for us to share. So. Well, thank You're you. You're awesome. Thank <laughs> you. Um, I'll, so talk you I'll talk to you tomorrow morning at seven. <laughs> I got you. Call me now. Hang on one second. I'm just going to read the extra. Um, and that's our show in two weeks. On April, April 3rd at 7 p.m., Joy and I will interview the legendary Jerry Zaks, who has directed 26 Broadway shows. He has received four Tony Awards and been nominated eight times. Jerry has also directed 17 off-Broadway productions, including the original productions of Assassins, Sister Mary Ignatius, Baby with the Basswater, and The Marriage of Bet and Boo. He received the SDC's George Abbott Award for Lifetime Achievement in the Theater, and it is a 2013 inductee to the Theater Hall of Fame. I'm looking forward to this interview. Please, everyone, go see a show. Broadway and Off-Broadway is open. Um, go see a show. Be safe. And uh, we love you. Thank you for coming out. Thank you, Danielle. We love you. Good night.